Welcome to the Sustock Podcast. I'm Susumu Rocky. It's March Madness, baby! My guest host, this time around, hosts his own podcast, Storming the Court, where he talks everything in college basketball, in the NCAA, and he and I, we used to co-produce WRHU's The Baseline, the premiere show talking everything college hoops, and he is back again to talk about some brackets, talking tournament. It's back, Ryan. Well, well, coming back to the show is Ryan Connell. Ryan, thank you so much for returning to the show. I am so excited. We've waited two years for this. Two years, Susumu. I am so glad that you had me back. You had me on at pretty much the beginning of the season. It's great to be back at the end of the season and know that we will actually be playing an NCAA tournament this year. Just a lot of lots of great juices flowing, and there's there's far there's very few people that I love talking college basketball more with than you, Sus, because it's just I like to hear your your perspective um, from a, a different person that follows the sport that maybe doesn't follow it as close as I do, but like provide some different someone who follows it so closely, you know, overlooks a lot of time. So it's great to hear your perspective. And we had such a blast talking college hoops uh, that whole season. We produced uh, our show together, the baseline back at WRHU and throughout our time there. Uh, it's just great to always reconnect and chat some March madness. I'm pumped. It's, oh, we missed this so much last year, like having the, everything get canceled in the middle of conference tournaments, which is like the great appetizer to March Madness. Like you're just, everyone's starting to finally get into college basketball that, you know, has been following football and everything else all year long. They're like, all right, my, my attention's fully on college basketball that gets stripped from right underneath of you last year. A lot of teams, you know, d- got hosed. I'm not going to lie in terms of like last year would is probably the best year that Dayton would ever have a chance of winning a national championship. They never got to play that, but It's really great that this year there was a way that we could finally make this all happen and bring back one of the best sporting events in the entire world. I'm excited because I remember I was working around that time, and during this time, I was uh, in the middle of going through jury duty. So, (laughs) you know, that was during, like, when tournament was happening, when all the conference tournaments were going on, and I watched – like at work, I watched Hofstra win the win the CAA, and I thought I was going to be able to see some of my some of our friends yeah. get to call an NCAA tournament, but it never happened, and it, it is a bummer, and it's unfortunate. But you know what? We it's back now. It, this time, mm-hmm. it's just a little bit different because it's not spread out across the country like it usually is. It's all contained. In, in one area, one specific area. It's in Indianapolis. And I think, God, that is – who could have picked a better place to have a college basketball bubble? Yeah, I mean, it's it's with the headquarters of the NCAA are in Indianapolis. So that's offices for every sport. That's their national, like, corporation is based in uh, Indianapolis. Indiana is one of the – probably one of the two best states for basketball in the entire country. I think you could put North Carolina right back up there in terms of the amount that people care about basketball in that particular state. I would say Indiana and North Carolina are the easy one-two combo. Kentucky is probably right behind it. Um, and – Indianapolis and the surrounding like metropolitan area, there's so many good venues. And I think that's what we're going to see on display in this NCAA tournament. Like normally you see the final four played in a big, you know, football stadium, which we will Lucas oil stadium will be the host of the final four, but the different venues along the way, we're going to get to see Mackey arena, which is Purdue's, you know, home floor assembly hall, like the famous, you know, scene from Hoosiers. Like that's Indiana's like the university of Indiana university's home court. You'll see Hinkle Fieldhouse, one of the oldest houses of college basketball, the home of the Butler Bulldogs, IUPUI, Baker's Life Fieldhouse, the host of the Pacers. There's just so many great venues in a small area where it was such a sensible thing because the Final Four was already supposed to be in Indianapolis as it was. Being at the home of the NCAA, it was just the perfect marriage. All right, let's get into it because uh, so we this year, is, it's, it's really nice because the one seeds this year, they're all very convincing national championship contenders. So we have one seed. The number one overall seed is Gonzaga. They come into this this tournament undefeated. You have Baylor, then you have in Illinois, and then Michigan. And by the way, this whole this whole tournament has been dominated by Big Ten teams. It's there's Big Ten teams in all all four regions, 
And I got to tell you, this, I, I, when I see all these one, te- one seeds and I, I analyze them for the past 24 hours, I'd say, I got to tell you, like, so three of these teams qualify for the 2020, they, they're 2020 club candidates. So they are Gonzaga, Illinois, Michigan. And what we mean by this 2020 yeah. is that they rank both in offensive and defensive efficiency in the Kempom range. Yep. Top 20. Both You have to be in the top 20 for both categories to qualify for this. And for the past couple of tournaments, except for 2014 with UConn, every champion has been a part of this club. We've talked about... Yeah, believe it, actually... Yeah, I, I think if I interrupt here, I think it goes all the way back to 2000, I think, is the is the cutoff. Like the beginning of the Ken Palm database is like 01, 02, but he did track stats before that. So essentially, since the turn of the millennium, only one team has won the national championship, not ranked in the top 20 in both offensive and defensive efficiency. And that was UConn in 2014 when they were a seven seed. Like they just went on a crazy one with run with Shabazz Napier and got all the way to the final four, won the whole thing. That's the outlier. Like most of the time you have to be a well-rounded team uh, and you have to be good in both offense and defense. As you mentioned, Gonzaga, Illinois, Baylor all fit that build. Last three uh, NCAA tournaments have all been one by one seeds. Like we're starting to kind of see that the best teams actually do win this tournament for how much, you know, volatility there is and upsets and everything else. When it actually comes down to the national championship, of the teams that advance to the final four, most of the time it's the best team that wins. I think we should go like one by one to each because they rank all these teams like Gonzaga's like the number one overall. And then I'd say that Michigan's like quadrant, like they're ranked as the the weakest one seed, I'm, I'm presuming. Yeah, so it goes. And then if you go top left, which is Gonzaga, that's one. Bottom left is four, which is Michigan. Top right is Baylor, which is two. And Illinois is three in the bottom right. Um, essentially, they only they would only want the one, the number one overall seed and the number two overall seed to play each other in the national championship. That's like there, are, like that's if everything went to plan and the favored team won every step of the way. That's how it would turn out, and that's like the that's the way that they want to keep it. I've always I felt that this was. This was, for me, the top three teams is Gonzaga number one, then Illinois, and then Michigan. Just because of the fact that if I'm fa- factoring the fact that they're both in within this club, I have to put them in my top three. And the odd man out is, of course, Baylor. And I understand Baylor. Look, we talked about Baylor before. And during the American season, they looked like the most unstoppable force. They were facing off against team after team after team. They were beating these teams in the conf- in their own conference, which was a bloodbath, by the way. But mm-hmm. they started slowing down a bit. And this is the problem that I have with Baylor every single time they get into the tournament is that, God, they look so great. It come, they look so great in the regular season. But then once you put them in the tournament, they, they just underperform. You've had cases where they will just drop, lay an egg and lose to some of these like double digit seeded teams. We've seen this before. So when you look at this Baylor team and they're kind of sort of hobbling in compared to the other three, like what's the concern and how, what is their potential that somebody in their conference could trip them up? The difference of Baylor of tournaments past into Baylor and now the last two seasons is that they have completely kind of, I wouldn't say changed their program, but kind of changed the narrative on who they are. Like, yeah, Baylor was a team that would always enter the NCAA tournament. They lost as a five seed to to Yale, where they got that famous quote from, I believe it was Jonathan Motley after the game. You know, they were the best rebounding team in the country, and they got out-rebounded by just a bunch of guys from Yale. Like, And there was was a couple of great quotes in the post-game press conference after that um, about rebounding the basketball, and we just didn't grab the ball. Like, it's essentially like what he said. And he's like, yeah, you didn't rebound the ball. Like you didn't grab it. Uh, that's why you lost. Uh, well, the thing with Baylor is last year, they're probably the second best team in the country outside of Kansas. They split head to head with Kansas in 2020 Kansas. If there was an NCAA tournament would have been the number one overall seed last year. They were the best team top to bottom. They had the national defensive player of the year. They had two first team, all Americans. Like, they were a stacked Kansas team. Well, they lost both those two, th- two first team All Americans. They were brought back the National Player of the Year in Marcus Garrett, but you saw with them, they were kind of up and down. They had their moments. Baylor brought everyone back except their starting center. 
the guy that they thought was going to step in and be their starting center wasn't medically cleared to play this year. So they brought back four starters, three guys off the bench, and then got a transfer in the process. And Adam Flagler, he transferred from Presbyterian. He was freshman of the year in their conference, um, the Southland, where he averaged like 15 points a game. Sat out all of last year, so he got to practice, got to play with the team. Then this year comes in off the bench. He was pivotal in their win against Illinois back in the non-conference season in December. He was great down the stretch for them as well. Baylor has kind of changed their narrative. Like they've constantly and consistently been one of the two or three best teams in college basketball for the span of the last two full seasons. So as much as you like to, you know, say that they are shaking the NCAA tournament, don't get me. There are things that kind of, you know, they're not the best rebounding team like they have been in years past, but they are the number one three point shooting team in college basketball. They shoot over 42% as a team. Like that's insane. And we talk about like three point shooting that dominates basketball at large, like NBA youth level college. Now everything they're really deadly when it comes to that end. Sure. They might not have the interior size that some of the other teams do, but like basketball has become so positionless and the way that they just match up by playing, um, they play like a matchup zone. Sometimes they play man and the amount of depth they have. I'm not as concerned about them as a lot of other people are. Um, sure, they didn't finish the season strong. Sure, like they also had three weeks off because of COVID. Was that like, oh, they had like one positive test. They were all just forced to quarantine. It was like there was a widespread outbreak across the team. They didn't release which players actually got COVID, um, but many people uh, around college basketball actually, by deep, diving a little bit deeper and having some connections with the coaches, unofficially released that they had like eight or nine of their players of the 15 guys on the roster actually tested positive for COVID. So like all of them were now then like, you know, done without doing any physical activity for two weeks leading up to their game against Iowa state, which was their first game back in 24 days. They only won by three, even though they were favored by like 20 uh, because they had literally two practices in 23 days and then they played a game. Then they played, then they had one more practice the next day. And then they lost their first game of the season at Kansas on senior day, which was Kansas is like final game of their regular season until they schedule an after the fact. So it's like leading up to the first game they lost all year. They had three practices in one game in 25 days. Like, that's a lot of sitting around, a lot of un, like it showed in the Kansas game, like their legs were just tired. They're coming up short on shots. That's something that they uncharacteristically hadn't done all year. They shot like 32% uh, or under 35% from the floor all season long. They were constantly around 50%. It was an off game and sure. They lost in the big 12 tournament to Oklahoma state that like Oklahoma state has one of the most electric players in college basketball and Cade Cunningham. Like he's probably going to be the first pick in the NBA draft. Sure. There are, there is a little bit concern, but I am, you know, much higher on Baylor than I think a lot of people are. You you also convinced me on the fact that when you look at their region, nobody really stands out that could really toss. No, them. that's the thing. So I like, yeah, yeah, yeah like that. That's why a lot of people want to pick against them, but like point out a team in the region that's better than them. That's going to beat them. Like there's not really yeah. a team. Like I, I do. I trust Ohio State. Probably oh. not. Do I trust uh, Arkansas? Absolutely not. Uh, I was like Villanova. They're all hurt. Purdue, I mean, they're all, they're really young. Like their backcourt's all freshmen. Sure, they have a guy that's seven foot four, but like, you're going to tell me he's going to get up and down the floor with a guy with a bunch of three point shooters? I don't think so. Like that, they have an, they have an easier region than I think people realize. One of the things that I love that I always pinpoint is which teams have a top five lottery talent? And is that top lottery talent surrounded by enough talent? Like, you know, so I'll give you an example mm -hmm. of how of where I came up with this. And I'm going to come up with like a name for this at some point. I swear I will. All right. All right. I'll, I'll have a nice corollary. Name. Yeah. I'm, something I'm like excited. That. I'm excited. I'm excited for that one. Yeah, I think I'm going to dub this the lot. I'm going to dub this the at the lottery's curse. I, I think I'm going to call this. So when I when I say that this, I discovered this through the past couple tournaments. When you have a player who's projected to be a top five or a top three NBA talent it, or heading into the next NBA draft, they're a top three or top five, like projected pick. So mm -hmm. let's take a look at Trey young, for example, who was with Oklahoma. He was projected to be a, probably top three, top five that year heading in, right? 
Maybe this could be the Trey Young corollary. Or something along that, but there's also other examples too. Like guys like Anthony Bennett, guys like Otto Porter, and Anthony Bennett. Come on. No, I, I, come on. Well, he was projected <laughs> around that area. And then Well, I mean, he also went number one overall, but he's also out of the league and didn't last more than like two years in the NBA. Oh, okay, so. fair. Okay, fair. But still, <laughs> Otto Porter. He was projected to be around a top three, top five pick heading into that upcoming draft. And that was the year when he when he was with Georgetown, that was the year they lost to Florida Gulf Coast. So Trey Young, yeah. when he was with Oklahoma for his one and done, that was the year they lost to Rhode Island in the first round. Yeah, they were the it was a seven ten game. So uh, Oklahoma, I think, was the seven, right? So what I'm saying okay. what I'm saying with this, what I'm saying with this court with this 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 theory that I have is that if you have a team, if you have a team that has a top three, top five talent that's heading into the NBA draft projected to be a top three or top five pick, and but you can't name anybody else on their team, fade them immediately. Fade them. So what? Yeah, I, I I agree with what you're saying, but and let me let me play a little devil's advocate here. How does that like like what about John Morant at Murray State? Like they were a 12 seed, they upset the five seed, they made the Sweet 16. Like how it's, does that work? Like no one else, they didn't know anyone else on Murray State. Like, I, I think it, it's a. I think this this theory he needs a little more work. It, but it's but a while, I will say that like for the majority of the case, like if they're okay. if they're like the the favorite, like the top seed, fade them immediately, essentially. So I yeah, I would I would say this works like say like power conference teams with a projected lottery pick, but not a lot of surrounding parts is what yeah, you say. So. Because like, like a mid major, like you could get lucky with an upset and have a really good player on your team, and that could be the only good player you have. But if he scores like thirty points a game or he has a triple double in the NCAA tournament, like John Morant, it doesn't matter because he's just going to win the game for yeah, you. Yeah. So the two teams that qualified, the two teams that fit this criteria, USC with Evan Mobley, I believe his name is Evan. Sometimes I forget. It is. It is. He has a brother Isaiah who's also on the team. So there are two Mobleys that start. Yeah. And so play sometimes with the I completely forget. And then even then, like USC, I have like a very sour taste in my mouth because I remember I was listening to, I think it was their game against Arizona, and they just looked, they just out, outright lost to that team. So yeah, I already have extremely sour, souring on them even before I knew that Evan Mobley was was on the team, and then. Oklahoma State fits this criteria too, because aside for Kate Cunningham is the top projected pick, and I get it. Like they're very polarizing. This this Oklahoma State team is extremely polarizing because on the one hand I have you saying that they're underseeded, but on the other hand mm-hmm. I'm looking at different graphs and statistics saying that this team did not deserve the seeding that they got. So. It's polarizing, and I'm still trying to figure out whether I want I'm gonna have Liberty upset them. I think that's the popular pick. Like I've seen a lot of people saying that they might they're probably picking Liberty to make another upset. And then, as I'm going through last night, I completely forgot that Liberty two years ago upset Mississippi State. So mm-hmm. same coaches there too. And don't sleep on the flames. Usually, you, you know. Usually, lightning doesn't strike twice. So that's the thing why I have, I'm have i already having Oklahoma State advance against uh, Liberty. And I also think because, like, Kate Cunningham kind of fits that, like, that, that shot-creating guard that usually you depend, teams depend on to get that one bucket that they need to get the win. So I think Cunningham fits that, fits that profile. And... I think Oklahoma State. I'm not saying that they're gonna get pa- they're gonna be an elite eight team because, like, my goodness, I think they're they're. I'm pretty sure they're an Illinois uh, conference region. They region. are. They are. They're an Illinois bracket conference. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> and but I will say the one thing about Oklahoma State is that they played well when like Cade Cunningham was hurt. So the last game of their regular season, it was on the road at West Virginia. Cade Cunningham didn't play; had an ankle injury. So like. It's my, and like West Virginia ended up as a three seed, Oklahoma, well, Oklahoma State's a four seed. Oklahoma State beat West Virginia in the last game of the regular season, beat them in the first round of the Big 12 tournament, then beat Baylor in the Big 12 tournament, and then lost to Texas in the Big 12 championship. But like, how can you justify seeding West Virginia over Oklahoma State? And I like West Virginia, but like just from that perspective alone of what they did head to head, they had similar resumes. Oklahoma State had more quad one wins, which is like the big deal breaker for the committee. 
They made their conference championship game. They beat a number one seed and they beat a team that's ranked higher than them twice in back-to-back games at the end of the season. Like, I, I, I just, I don't understand why that's just one of the, only, one of the few seed discrepancies that I just don't really get. Yeah. I, again, that's the thing of why I think Oklahoma state is the most polarizing team in this tournament. It's because I can't gauge whether they're actually underrated or overrated. And yeah. so let, let's, um, I'm going to bring this back over to the one seed. So we talked about Baylor. We talked about Gonzaga for a little bit. Illinois comes in pretty hot. Like they have a, yeah, they're a red lot hot. of they're red a hot. lot of momentum is on their side, and they're led by Ao Dunsunmu, and then like the the emerging guy that for them has been Co- Kofi Coburn, who really stepped up. And my God, so this team is coached under um, Brad Underwood, I believe his name is Brad yep. Underwood, and this is the same guy that led a handful of upsets by, with Stephen F. Austin. He coached with Oklahoma State for a few years, and then now he has his Illinois job. And really, this is this is exactly why the, the Illini hired him because they wanted someone who could get this team to the next level. And my, they did it. Now they're like the third best team in all of the nation, and they're coming in mm-hmm. real with a lot of momentum. So, what do you see with Illinois? Because I'm feeling like they're a lot of people are going for them now because they yeah they're like they're the, like the like a lot of people are saying like they're the one team that like they match up with Gonzaga in the national championship, like they win. Like, and it's like, yes, but like, are they playing? Did they peak too early? Like they've won 14 of their last 15 games. They have six wins versus AP top 10 teams this season. That's tied for the most in any, by any team in big 10 conference history. They have 12 quad one wins, which are the most quad one ones in division one this season. Oklahoma state is second with 10. Um, yeah, sure. They are red hot. They just won the big 10 title in overtime against Ohio state. They arguably have the second best player in the college basketball in Io DeSumo only behind Luca Garza. Some may say he might be even more valuable to his team than Luca Garza is and might actually win national player of the year. But Illinois, ah, gets me with them is like, I like them at the beginning of the season. Like I ranked like the top five teams at the beginning of the season in college basketball. And I had Gonzaga one, Baylor two, Villanova three, uh, Illinois four, and Iowa five. And like I was like, Illinois is like sneaky good to make the NCAA tournament. I thought they'd be like a two or three seed. But and then at the beginning of the season, they lost a couple of games that they probably shouldn't have lost. Like they didn't play a great game against Baylor the one time they played them. They lost, they had a couple non conference losses, and everyone was just like, is this team like actually for real? They dropped to like, tw- into the twenties of the AP top 25 and everyone's like, all right, but then they like something clicked mid season and they've just been on a tear. I like them to go pretty far. I just don't know. I, I eventually, I think it's going to catch up to them and they're going to lose. Like, that's the thing. Like the NCAA tournament is not a seven game series. Like if, if every, if they played a seven game series against Oklahoma state or against, you know, Gonzaga or something, they probably would win or have a, a greater chance to win in a one game scenario. Like if they just have a bad shooting night, or Kofi Coburn gets in foul trouble. Like, it could just all just disappear in one game. And that's the same thing with any team. Like, that Gonzaga's whole thing could fall apart. Like, their perfect season just goes because they have a bad 20 minutes. Like, you know, they have a bad one half of basketball, and there there goes a whole season for nothing. Like, I I just think Illinois, eventually, it's going to catch up to them. I don't know why I think that. I think also part of why I'm like fading them a little bit is because they become such like a chalky pick. That's like not Gonzaga to win. Like they're getting the second most love of any team on ESPN.com to win um, the whole thing. Um, So I I just, that's, that's where I kind of draw the line. Like right now, like four, 15% of people are picking them to win the whole thing to put it in perspective. Gonzaga right now is garnering almost 38% of all brackets have Gonzaga winning the whole thing. Illinois has the second, like most brackets coming in with 15%. So there goes, that's already 50 plus percent of all brackets filled out have Gonzaga or Illinois winning. So if you pick anyone else, you already have beaten half the field. Yeah, that, I mean, look, here's, here's, this is why we're talking about this. And I, I got to tell you, I was leaning towards Gonzaga, but with that information, I have to really consider the other options here, especially if you want to differentiate, differentiate yourself in a larger field. Let's yeah. go quickly to Michigan, which is one of those teams I'm considering because, again, they also fit within the 2020 club. And they're a team that looks so, like, 
great during the middle of the season, and they're head coached by a Fab Five member in Juwan Howard, and this team looks so happy, looks so excited, you know? They And then I think they hit a little bit of a snag at, during the tournament, and then afterwards, like, they come in a little hobbled in. That's why they're the fourth – they, they're basically the last-ranked first first seed. So when you look at this team and you look at who's in their – who is in their region? You have Alabama, who is coming in red hot. And that's a two seed. They're probably, I say, the strongest two seed. And then you also have... Yeah, they are. They, they, they yeah. are. They, the way the committee released it is they put the strongest two seed with the weakest one seed. So, yeah, Alabama is actually like the fifth rated team, according to the committee. Yeah, they're, 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 that's another discussion for another time. My God, that team. And they also have UConn to contend with. You Never underestimate the... UConn magic never do it like don't discredit it like I'm honestly thinking to myself like god why do they have to be slated to be facing like against someone like Alabama later but if there's any team that could get past defy any logic it's UConn because they do well the last the last time UConn was a seven seed in the NCAA tournament they did become the first and only seven seed to ever win the whole national the whole net the whole thing in 2014 so they've made they've made the tournament um two other, once since then in 2016 when they were playing in an 8-9 game but the last time they were a 7 seed became the only 7 seed ever in the whole yeah. thing so it's it's food for thought i i do say that they have they always they haven't this year this time around they have a guard that fits within their the profile of their last two championships a shot creating mm-hmm. guard that can base that they really depend on that can get that that bucket when they need it in book night mm-hmm. james book night Book, book book night oh book night okay. yeah. the u the u is the u is like an l but yeah yeah james book night of course he he played he was he was the biggest leading scorer before he injured his elbow missed eight games uconn went four and four without him there are 11 and three with him so oh. when he's on the floor they're a really good team <laughs> like they're probably one of the 20 best teams in the country and they play the one of the best defenses in the country in terms of like Hardcore man to man in the Big East. You think about it like a grind it out game. Like they they can play that style. They are top ten in the country in offensive rebounding. So they don't have that much great size, but all their guards rebound the ball exceptionally well. They play great defense, and yeah, they have a guy that could go off for 20, 25 points at will. He dropped forty in a game earlier this year against Creighton that they lost in overtime. So like he's capable of just absolutely taking over. And yeah, if they they play a team and they play him tight and it comes down to the final possession, they have a guy that they go to to make shots, and that's always dangerous. God, I just like anybody that's just gonna pencil in Alabama, just again. Hold your breath, hold hold on a second, and really consider the possibility that UConn could easily beat these guys. Well, not mm-hmm. and not like easily as in they oh they have this in the bag. Like these guys could actually make Alabama work potentially. Well, yeah, I mean, do you want to talk about Alabama real quick? Because like I I could like give a little thing on Alabama here. I, I knew I what you said before was that this team is very fast paced, but they also play a very fierce amount of defense too. Which is like a weird combination. Yeah. So like they are. Yeah. So they like defy what you would think of like a good team. So they're second in the country in defensive efficiency, um, 34th in offense. So they are one of the best defensive teams in the country. They can just absolutely grind you to like to nothing, but their offense is predicated on only taking uh, efficient shots. So what that means is that essentially they only take shots in the paint get fouled and go to the free throw line or take threes. Like they, they basically eliminated the mid range game altogether from like their repertoire. And it's a really fascinating thing. Like NATO, it's their coach, the way that he designs the floor and practice to like break their bad shooting habits of pulling up from, you know, deep twos and really contested mid range jumpers that are as proven by analytics, like an inefficient shot in today's basketball. He puts up like a point quadrant. So like every shot in the lane is two points. Every shot around in like the space outside the lane, but inside the arc is worth one. Everything around the three point line is worth three. 
and then he calls everything in Steph slash Dame range. So like NBA range and beyond where like Curry and Dame Lillard just pull up from wherever that's worth four. And so when they run practice up and down and they do like all these shooting drills, he encourages it. Like their goal is to obviously score the most amount of points. So that breaks their shooting habits and forces them to take shots from the perimeter or get all the way to the basket and not settle for those mid range jumpers. It's really like, advanced and modern and new way of basketball. And I think Nate Oates is on the cutting edge of like leading this into college. You've seen it in the NBA, but like this is matriculated into college. Sure. Teams take more threes, but he's essentially just eliminating mid range jumpers. So Alabama, they'll, they'll jack up, you know, 35, 43 is a game on you. They made 25 in a game earlier this year and set an sec record. So like they're capable of just going off and in the games that they shoot terribly, they have the defense to play a close, like a close game where they just don't give up points. So that's what makes them really unpredictable is the fact that, okay, if they don't have it shooting the ball, don't be worried because they'll just slow down the opposition. But if they have it and they get hot, their momentum of shooting kind of carries over game in game. And especially playing two games in like three days at a time, like, they get hot for a weekend, like they're on to the next round, like they're on to the next round. It's like full steam ahead. So they're they're one of those teams that like you don't want to see solely because when you think they're having a bad shooting day, they'll still beat you with defense. The one thing I will say is that like they're so like dead set on this like certain sub. If a team I want to see how a team like let's say like this UConn team manages to figure out a way to, you know, Kind of make them feel comfortable. Let's see how they adjust. That's the only thing you got to look out for. So, it, well, yeah, because it's like, it's weird the, how you try and like schedule, like how you try and game plan a defense to go about. Because it's like, okay, you press them. So they just don't, or aren't able to get open looks. Well, if you press them, they play faster and that's how they want to play. They want to play fast. So, like, you're playing into their hands. Then you're like, oh, we'll play a two, three zone. Well, that just encourages them to shoot more threes. It cuts out them off getting into the paint, but it encourages them to shoot from three, which they like to do. Okay, so you'll play a three, two zone. So you'll have more guys on the perimeter. Well, that encourages the, get them to get the ball inside, which they also want to do. So then do you play like a matchup zone or like a 1-3-1 one, one where you have more guys in the mid-range who can extend to the perimeter? But then there's always holes in a zone where they can work the ball to the high post and then they sk- could skip it to the corner for a three, throw it to the block for an easy layup. Like the way to play them, I guess, is only man-to-man. And I'm sure like UConn plays great man-to-man defense, but like they're going to have to work for it. Like uh, that, that's just the thing. There's not a great, as it stands right now, no one has really presented them with um, great defensive game plan to beat them because they want to, they can play in a few different ways and they can manipulate the game to go how they want. Yeah. All right. We got to look out for Alabama then. My God. Uh, let's, I want to quickly get into Michigan quick before uh, we get, we talk a little bit about upsets. And so this Michigan team comes in, and they have a they have Mo Wagner's brother, Franz Wagner. Franz, yeah, Franz, Hans and Franz. Franz, Franz Wagner, who is also a projected NBA draft pick, first round at the very least. He's cre- leaning into the lotteries. I've heard some talk about him cracking into the lottery picks, but he's with he's at least a first round a first round player. I that's a genuine thing. Yeah. And they also have a bunch of other interesting players. So. Make the case that Michigan could, if they had to face Alabama, like what's the case that they could get to the Final Four from and get out of this region? So I liked Michigan a lot throughout this whole season. I thought they were like going to be like one of my teams I take to the Final Four. What the last couple of weeks have been a little like I've been more hesitant on it all, uh, solely because their second best player Isaiah Livers is quote out indefinitely with a foot injury. So they say it's a stress reaction, which is not a stress fracture. So like. His foot's not actually broken, but the a stress reaction is basically a surrounding inflammation um, around the foot where it, it's like it causes a severe amount of pain just to walk or put pressure on it, let alone run up and down for 40 minutes playing basketball. So and like it only gets worse the more you use it, it gets more inflamed and it has a chance to induce more stress on the bone that will actually cause it to fracture. So they list him out indefinitely. He he didn't play in the game, uh, their game against Ohio State in the Big Ten tournament. So how long does he sit out? Does he sit out like this opening week and not play against the 16 seed? And then they take their chances playing the winner of LSU and St. Bonaventure and say, Hey, if we could get him healthy for the sweet 16, 
but I, I don't know. Like, because what he does to their team is he's like the silent leader. He, he's a senior. He's a four-year player. He's great defensively, athletic wing, shoots the ball well from the perimeter. Like when they talk about guys that like you want on your team and like you just put him out there and you just, you know, he's always going to perform. That's Isaiah livers. Um, but what, what, but Michigan, they do have a five-star freshman center in Hunter Dickinson, who's seven foot one has been one of the best. He made first team, all big 10, one of the best big men in the entire country. He shows that he can do a lot on his own. I mean, he talked about Wagner. He's explosive. Uh, they have a graduate transfer point guard and Mike Smith, who came from Columbia was a four-year starter. Fifth year, uh, you know, eligible, comes from an Ivy League team. There's no Ivy League in the tournament this year because they didn't play, but it's always maybe nice to have a guy with a lot of experience and a high basketball and also high just mental IQ. And so he's their their, um, starting point guard. Obviously, Jawan Howard's done a phenomenal job with that team all season long. I just don't know, like, the uncertainty with Isaiah Lewis being out is what gives me a lot of pause with them because – a matchup against like LSU in the second round, like LSU almost beat Alabama on Sunday and like LSU can just score on them. They have three guys that average over 16 points per game and just can go off. And so it's like, well, if Michigan doesn't have their second best player who's one of their best defenders and also one of their best offensive players, like, can they keep up with that? It is, it is a good, something to keep an eye on out for sure. And I also think that you have a rookie coach who's going into his first NCAA. And I get that. he. It's like, he, I mean, they were good last year though, too. Like he, like last year, Michigan and at the beginning of the season was not in the top 25, the preseason top 25. They extended all the way to number one by the end of November because they just, they started nine and zero last year. Sure. They didn't have a great end of the season last year, but yeah. Can he handle the big time? I mean, look at who Juwan Howard's played for in the pros, like under Pat Riley and uh, like Eric Spolstra, like, Although he didn't play that much towards the end of his career, he stuck around in the NBA for a long time. And why guys stick around in the NBA for a long time is because obviously they know some a lot more about basketball than just a regular bench guy. Sure, he didn't play that many minutes, but like he still had what like a 15 plus year NBA career. And he like like there's a reason those guys last. It's because they they you know are able to see the game differently. And clearly that's translated into massive success in Michigan winning the big 10 season, uh, big 10 regular season outright. Um, and it, it, I'm sure it'll translate into the NCAA tournament. It's just like, is Michigan like not playing well at the right time because they have, you know, a lot of uncertainty around them. That that's what gives me more pause. Not as much about Jawan Howard. All right, let's go into upset pace because this is usually the the fun part of the whole tournament is this picky, oh yeah picky, and this is the birth of where the Georgia State corollary comes from which I haven't decided on a team yet but so far it's leaning towards Georgetown because so much stuff happened with uh, Patrick Ewing and I think to myself like that's that's the stuff you got to look for the human interest stories here and you know Patrick Ewing finally being able to win a championship for the first time in since his days in Georgetown. Yeah. And that's that's the thing. That's the beauty of it all. And he does and he he's coached up this team that had no one saw coming. No one he saw them winning at the the Big East tournament. Because like Georgetown for like the past couple of years, and this is the reason why they hired someone like Patrick Ewing as their head coach, was because they were middling. Like they, they were on the bottom bottom rungs of the Big East for a for a long time. And I felt like they never really recovered from losing the Florida Gulf Coast that year. They never fully mm-hmm. recovered from that. But seeing no. Patrick Ewing take this team, and we usually always see this team like this every year, like extend past, go into the Sweet 16, or even go into the Elite Eight. Like a team that doesn't impress, look impressive or comes in hobbling, and then they, fi- they catch fire at the right time, and they go into the Sweet 16. We've seen this before. Remember that year when Syracuse got in and everyone was in an uproar saying yeah. that, oh, Tulsa. They should have never got in. They should have never got in. Yeah. Never got in. Uh, Tulsa, Tulsa had a better resume. It should have gone to Tulsa. And then afterwards, Syracuse basically advances all the way to the Elite Eight, and they trampled and upset and beat a lot of teams, a lot of better teams yeah. along the way. And they, well, they also, they drew a, they drew a favorable round of 32 matchup because the middle Tennessee beat Michigan ah. state that year. So they had to play a 15 seed middle Tennessee to get to the sweet 16. Like I, that's where I always draw the line with that Syracuse team. Sure. They made the final four, but like, did they really get challenged until the elite eight? No, <laughs> they did. 
Yeah, and to this day, I still root Michigan State to this day. Yeah, you you are a yeah, I, you Middle Tennessee was the death of Susumu. It was. I, I and I also will say that I don't, regardless of if Michigan State wins their first four, I always I, they're automatically out to me. You know why? Because they decided to enter a partnership where now they're called the Michigan State Spartans, presented by. <laughs> whatever company they made an agreement with. I'm like, come on, at least it's like, just say that amateurism is dead. <laughs> just please say, yeah, it, I mean, man. Yeah. Oh my God. I, yeah. that annoyed me when I read that. I was like, just say that amateurism doesn't exist anymore. Please just say that. Yeah. I just, I'm so done with this. And now I'm just like, okay, I, I thought I would like Michigan state. Cause I have a friend who's, I have a coworker who's actually also named Tom Izzo. Yeah, really? also named Tom Izzo, and yeah. he gets a lot of uh, a lot of Michigan State fans who accident or like stupidly, or I don't know if it's by accident or by on purpose. They just like will add him on Twitter, thinking that that's his Twitter. <laughs> and I'm like, you guys re- think that Tom Izzo has time to answer your tweets during the game? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, think. I yeah. need people to think. Oh my god. Okay, I needed to get that out of my system, but so no, that's that's completely. You, you get my point here is that every year we get like one. We either get the true upset, which is like a mid a mid major conference or a lower conference team ma- overachieving and getting to the Sweet Sixteen sometimes, and they have like this major upset win in the fir- round of sixty in the first round. And then we also have like those teams like Syracuse that. They are a power five conference that is that over underachieved heading into the, heading into the tournament. They get seated. Maybe there's a contention of whether they should be in or not, but then they overachieve and they make and they really make a splash. And part of me thinks like, God, I feel like that's Georgetown. Georgetown fits that bill to me because like no one, I don't think anyone's expecting them to make anything aside from they think, oh, they won the Big East and that's a great story. But I don't think they're good enough. I think they might actually pounce on some somebody. See, a lot of people I'm hearing are, are 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 you know going hook, line, and sinker with Georgetown. Like they're taking the bait here. Like like uh, they're like, oh, they're rolling in at the right time. Patrick Ewing, like back in the NCAA tournament, like he was such a dominant force. It's like, yeah, well, Patrick Ewing's fifty something years old, and he's not suiting up for the Hoyas. It's not like he's playing center. Like <laughs> you know, try. it's not like this is ninth. Is this nineteen eighty five again with the number one overall seed? Georgetown's the national championship game with Patrick Ewing as the national player of the year. Like that's not happening. Like there's a reason this team was three games under five hundred heading into the Big East tournament. They're not that good. Like, and you talked a little bit about Georgetown as like a program, like after that Florida Gulf Coast loss, they kind of lost their momentum as a program. They've been spiraling. Patrick Ewing's been there over four years now. Like they've also been spiraling. Mac McClung, their best player from last year, transferred out of the program. Their second best player, James Akincho, transferred out of the program. They both left Georgetown before this year because they didn't like the direction Georgetown was going in. Mac McClung went to Texas Tech, much better school. Akinjo went to Arizona, even though they were ineligible for the NCAA tournament, just because they didn't like the direction Georgetown was going. And I'm not knocking Patrick Ewing. I think he did a great job. And I think he capitalized the way that they needed to in the Big East tournament. The Big East tournament was always set up where I, as soon as Villanova had injury problems, I said, okay, this sets up either for Seton Hall, St. John, John's or someone else from the top of that bracket to get an easy way into the championship game. And then they just have to win one game and they're in the NCAA tournament. That's essentially what it was. Like Villanova, whoever they played, like was going to beat them. Okay, so Georgetown beats Marquette. They beat Villanova. Like Villanova almost did win that game. They fouled at the end. That end, A foul ended up deciding the outcome of the game. Not great, but sure, whatever. So Georgetown plays either Seton Hall or St. John's. Seton Hall gets by. Then you're like, oh, Seton Hall. Like they just got to beat Georgetown. They're in the Big East tournament. They're on the bubble. Like, man, they could steal a bit here if they win the Big East championship. Sure. Georgetown beat them. And then against Creighton, everyone's like, oh, well, Creighton, like, you know, they've never won the Big East tournament. But like, I, I, they're like, yeah, but like now Georgetown finally got to that point. And then what what happened to that game? I think is still an anomaly. 
uh, uh, like that's that's insane and like Georgetown like went on a run that was like at one point like 52 to like eight or something like they they outscored like them by like 40 points in the middle of the game like I was just like what's happening like it was like it was like a back and forth game it was like there's like five minutes left to go in the first half then you look up there's like 10 minutes left in the second half Georgetown's winning by like 30 so I mean sure they're they're peaking at the right time but like how does it like that's winning four games in four consecutive days now they have a week off where that momentum has died down, they've kind of reached the pinnacle of being at top of the Big East. Like, I don't know. Just, I, I, I am I, 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 like, I, I get why people are liking them and liking Oregon State for the same reason. They were both picked to finish last um, by the coaches and the media at the beginning of the season. They were both picked to finish last in their conference. They won their conference tournament. They got in the NCAA tournament. But like, they reached their pinnacle of success already this season. Like, that's that's at least the way I'm looking at it. Both those teams have peaked. Now they're on the way back down. I think everyone likes to pick a 12 over a five because it happens 30 of the last 35 years. A 12 has beaten a five seed. Three 12 seeds beat four seed, or beat five seeds in, la- in the last NCAA tournament in 2019. But I think a lot of people are going to fall for the Georgetowns and the Oregon States because they're from a power conference. I just don't, I don't see it. This one's going to be interesting because I was also thinking Oregon State was going to be Tennessee because – I'll give you the reasons because Tennessee's been up and down throughout the season. But that's the same thing with the same thing with Colorado. Like Colorado has a few really bad losses on the resume. It wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me if both these teams win. But like on the on just like a one game scenario, I'm going to take the better team who's been the better team all year long because of the fact that like so many people are on these two teams, and it's like I think they've already reached their their the best that they can be. I'm gonna go with like so. In my case, like, okay, when you look at the 5-12 matchup, I, and, and I'm immediately penciling in you, uh, the Gauchos of Santa Barbara. The, oh, the Gauchos are my team. Sus, you are speaking to a big Gaucho supporter right <laughs> Let's here. Let's go. I will. The big, the big West, out of the Big West, I am a big fan of the Gauchos. They won 18 of their last 19 games. They're piping hot. And Creighton, I mean, I mean, Creighton is a mess. Like, they lost to Georgetown in the Big East Championship game by, like, 25 yeah. They have like a lot of institutional struggle where their coach is placed on administrative for relief for making racist comments. So players on the team weren't happy with them. Then their star player came out and said, okay, we have coaches back. They reinstated him after missing just one game. And then they lose, they get blown out in the Big East tournament. There just seems to be so many like outside factors of like just everything. And there's so much madness within the Creighton program that I'm just like, I cannot. I, like they're a good team. Like they, there's a reason they've been ranked all season long. But like, for the volatility of a one game scenario, I cannot trust a team that has so many internal issues. Yeah, it's basically the opposite of the Georgia State corollary. It's the anti, the anti Georgia State corollary. <laughs> it, you have so many bad yeah. things happening all at once that eventually you just like, okay, we got, we, you, you're just done. You're done. I, I can't, I can't look at you. But like, think. Well, for an example, like, yeah. But for an example, like, like two years ago or three years ago, so 2018, like Arizona, Arizona with DeAndre and Alonzo Trier and company were four seed. I picked them all the way to go all the way to the national championship game. Cause I said, this team has like a severe amount of talent. They lost in the first round because they had looming NCAA allegations against them, which is holding them out of this year's NCAA tournament. But like there was all that looming stuff coming out about them, like cheating and, and paying Aiton to come to school. But I was like, Hey, they're a good team. Like they're going to be my sleeper team to get to the final four. They lost in the first round because like, I, not because there's all that around it, but like that has to weigh into it at least a little bit. Um, and that's also the thing that's like I'm concerned with like Kansas, Kansas, because like we were, we talked like we were texting like they are also kind of dealing with their own investigation right now because. But they also have COVID problems, too, that held them out yeah. of Big 12 okay. tournament. So, like, they're really tricky. Yeah, so this, this is the this is the problem, because like on the one hand, I like this Kansas team because what I what I. Well, I love Kansas teams when I, I can't I can't identify a lottery pick on this team. If they if I can't find a lottery pick on this team, I I feel great about this team because the last few times they had top top NBA talent on their team, early exits, early exits, early exits. Yeah. Josh Jackson when he was there, early exit. Joel Embiid and, and Andrew Wiggins were on that team, early exit. Though to be fair, that was because one of them was injured. And yeah, Embiid, Embiid was hurt most of his college yeah, career. Yeah, so that was but, unfortunate. Yeah. 
and we realized that Wiggins can't, couldn't really like carry a team by himself. Yeah, well, Wiggins was bad in college, and he's still bad in the NBA. I will stand by that. <laughs> Andrew Wiggins is not a good basketball player. I will, I always, I will fight anybody. Like I fight people on that all the time. Everyone's like, oh, like that was a great move for the Warriors trading for him. I was like, tell me what he does well. Like he sucks. Like he's athletic. Like there's a lot of guys that are like he shoots like 35 percent. Like in college, he shot. For the whole season, like 29% from beyond the arc and like less than 40% from the floor. Like he just doesn't do anything well. He's just a freak athlete who was just highly He's touted just out of thing. high school because like every every team he played, he was just so much better than. But like when he actually plays against good players, he's not good. That's my Andrew Wiggins stuff. This isn't about Andrew Wiggins. This is about the 2021 NCAA tournament. Sus. We're done with Andrew <laughs> Wiggins. He's gone. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry I brought him up. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. All right. So I'm going to let's wrap things up by simply saying that, you know, what I will say is that I think the number one like variant is, on all of this is that it's all in one location and aside the, I think the sole team that has like a firm advantage is any, any of these teams that are from Indiana or around like the Midwest area, that whole area. So I'm looking directly at Purdue and I'm thinking to myself, Ooh, I think they could strike because they they're familiar with the area and they haven't really had to move. So yeah. they have, I feel like Purdue has a distinct advantage and by the way, I, I'm going to give out and just say that my final four, so as of recording, I'm thinking to myself, Gonzaga, even though the what I love about Iowa is that they have the nat- perennial national player of the year, Luca Garza, who we always have these guys like occasionally like you had the, the legendary college basketball player and like the one he needs that one run to really cement his legacy. So I think... Mm. But I look at the the path that Iowa has to take. So they're facing Grand Canyon, who's like the, in their first ever tournament. So you know, easy path. Don't sleep on Grand Canyon. Uh, don't they, sleep don't on the antelopes. The antelopes. Bryce Drew's their coach. The, the brother of Scott Drew, the coach of oh. Baylor. Bryce Drew, famous shot from Val. He hit the famous shot for Valparaiso in the NCAA tournament back in the '90s, which was a big upset at the time. Mm. Just saying. Just saying. Grand Canyon. Just saying. I still think. And the, respect the antelopes. That's all. <laughs> I, I still think I wins, but respect the antelopes. I, That's a cool nickname. Yeah, the antelopes. Um, yeah, I, and then they, they face either VC or Oregon, but most likely Oregon because Dana Altman, there, if there's one thing that about a Dana, Dana Altman <laughs> team is that he, they, he comes in, he makes sure that, that, that his teams are prepared for the tournament. He really does. He because I looked at mm-hmm. his stat and every he's won like consistently in the first round at the very least. He gets his teams out of the first round and he's made runs before. He's made runs before, and they yeah. have like that guard, like very like a Peyton Pritchard type players. Like they always have like a shot creating guard. Chris du- Chris Duarte is their senior guard. Yeah, he's yeah. good. He's so I good. I think Iowa still beats them, but like it's Oregon. Dan Holman's going to make them work for it, and then you face potentially Kansas. So that's going to be another one where I think they're going to have to work, they're going to have to work for it. They have a really I feel like Iowa has a really tough road ahead of them. And I still think they can get to the Elite Eight. I just think eventually they get worn down by Gonzaga because, like, yeah. Well, they Gonzaga already beat. So that's the thing about Gonzaga's region. So Gonzaga, the three teams in their region are that are the other like high seeds are Iowa the two, Kansas the three, Bill, uh, Virginia the four. They played all three of them in the regular season. Those are like the three power conference teams that's they played, and they beat all of that's them. Coincidence. And they beat all of them. They put them in there for a reason because they already beat them. Like, like. Don't say that the NCAA like, doesn't want to have an un- undefeated team in the final four. They gave them the easiest bracket. It's it's very clear. But like, I mean, I respect it. Like, because Kansas and Virginia already both have COVID problems, like in their conference tournaments. So like, that's another advantage. Okay, so then they play Iowa again. But like, they blew. They scored a hundred points against Iowa. Like, it's ins- Jalen Suggs went for made nine threes or something in that game against Iowa. Like, it's insane. Like. Like there's a reason why it's it's structured that way. Um, but yeah, I I still think Gonzaga comes out of the region. They're my pick out of the region. I have them playing Kansas in the Elite Eight um, solely because I think Kansas can beat Iowa. I just like I want to I want to move Iowa along, but it's just like uh, yeah. I don't know. I can't trust. They're so bad defensively. I can't trust them. I, I'm gonna depend on the pedigree of Luca Garza because what I what I will say is that Garza, you know, NBA talent. Eh. You know, maybe second rounder or late first rounder potentially, yeah. but like he's someone that like a, a bench, a bench, guy. bench guy in the NBA. Yeah, uh, bench guy. Yeah, so he's a bench guy. Like that. Yeah, but he, he's not as he's not as athletic. Like he, you know, he's like like he's a 
<laughs> no, nah, I think that's a bad comp. He's a better version of Boban. <laughs> I, uh, he's just not seven. He's just not seven four or whatever. He's just you know. He's, he's kind of like, <laughs> like, a he's like stiff. He has like. He's he's stiff, but he can shoot now. Like he's worked on his three point shooting. He shoots like forty percent from deep. So I mean, there is a little bit, but yeah, he just can't move. I just I like, like his smile like when he, he just, when yeah. he smiles. I I like when he smiles because like he's not the he's got he's got yeah he's got cinder blocks just tied to his ankles. That's all. <laughs> cinder blocks. <laughs> I I, I want to root for that guy. because like yeah, I like him. I love him. And again, it's like college. Like I said, college basketball legend types. But I, that's I yeah. want. We need the story written for him because, like, it's throw throw him in the Aaron Kraft Tyler Hansborough group. Exactly, and there you go. that's what I was add, thinking. Add him to the exactly. mix. Yeah, add him to the He's mix. He's that kind of guy. Perry Perry, El- Perry Ellis is also in that mix. <laughs> that mix because he was at Kansas for like twenty years. <laughs> They're throwing Perry Ellis. He isn't playing for Kansas this, this year. They wish he's, he was. He's in he's every not. single Kansas Kansas yearbook. You just have to really spot him. He's there. But you'll you'll find. Yeah, he's he, there. He's lurking. He's like the shining. <laughs> uh, all right. So I think the region I'm still like as of recording, I'm still have my uh, I'm still trying to figure out is essentially the the has to. I think it's like the east and the south are the only two because like you give me a lot to think about with those with those two regions and Midwest. I'm still I'm still for Illinois. I think they'll make it out of the final four. The only team that I could remotely compete against them, I'd say is Houston. But even then, I'm just like eh, Houston is good, but. They're not as battle tested compared to Illinois. That's what I'll say. I'm, I, I have Illinois going all the way to the Elite Eight, but I have them losing to West Virginia. I have West Virginia in the wow, final Wow, you're really going bracket. for Bob Huggins, huh? They win their first game against Drexel, sure. Shouts to Drexel. Love the CA rep. Okay, Loyola Chicago is the number one defensive team in terms of defensive efficiency. Georgia Tech just won the ACC tournament title. That's already an incredibly difficult second round game. So they have to get past that. Then if they play like Oklahoma State and Cade Cunningham, like, Another game where they're just going to have to really grind and grind. Eventually, like after that game, playing another grinding out game against a team like West Virginia and or Houston, like, I mean, Illinois is good, but like there's, that's where I see the potential for them to possibly slip up. I don't have them, you know, eventually, like not all the number one seeds can make the final four. That's only happened once in the tournament's existence since it expanded to the 64 teams, like in 2008. So like, Eventually, teams are going to have to lose, and I, I don't know. For some reason, I like West Virginia. They they play you know, obviously good defense. That's what they're known for. They shoot the ball really well. Their best player, Deuce McBride, Miles McBride. He um he takes over games. He can score thirty like it, like it's nothing. Derek Culver is, I think, one of the only players uh, on the post presence that could keep up with Kofi Coburn. Coburn is like probably like thirty pounds heavier than him, but Culver is a walking double double. And so I think that's where, like, if they were to play them, they have the pieces that kind of mix that like exactly the types of things Illinois does well, are the same things that West Virginia does well. So I think if there's one team that plays a comparable style, it is them. I just can never trust Houston. Um, I do have Houston in the sweet 16. I just can't, I can, I have to take the pedigree of a team like West Virginia over Houston, just because on the, on the pure premise that Houston is never challenged by anyone in the American. And when they do lose to some of the teams in the American, they lose to really bad teams because they, and so it's just like, I, I don't know, like a lot of like people like Houston to be the team that knocks off Illinois. I just can't trust them. I like West Virginia in the final four. That's, that's like, I, I would guess of the, of the four teams I have going to the final four, that's the one that I, I guess I'm, I'm least confident in it, or it's like my deepest long shot, but I think West Virginia is very live. Yeah. You pointed out that they have potential to, uh, that's someone to if you're going to bet on teams getting into the final four that's a ticket you want to take all yeah. right so ryan thanks so much for popping on i really appreciate it um so let the people know how they can reach out to you on social media and what you've been up to yeah so you could find everything you need to know about my show my show storming the court or on apple podcast spotify wherever else podcasts are found follow me on twitter at rye underscore kennel that's r y underscore c o n n e l l um, I will have a show out, another show out this week leading up to the NCAA tournament with my full picks and everything, round by round, matchup by matchup, all the way to the Final Four and the big dance. Since I gave you already two of my Final Four picks, I'll throw out the others. I have Gonzaga out of the West, Baylor out of the South, West Virginia out of the Midwest, and I have Alabama out of the East. I have Gonzaga over Alabama, Baylor over West Virginia, and I have Baylor beating Gonzaga for the national championship. Solely, like, not solely because I, I think that I thought 
during the season. Baylor was going to be, I think, the only team that could knock off Gonzaga and play, you know, the way that they like to play a style that can beat Gonzaga. I'm going to hold firm on that. I still think Gonzaga is probably going to win. But from the, the the sure, like, you have to be different. You can't just pick Gonzaga. And, like, this is the only other team they have that much confidence in. I'm going to roll with Baylor. I, I think they could get it done, and, and Scott Drew can finish off, which has been a, a remarkable two years for Baylor basketball. All right. Thanks so much, Ryan. I really appreciate you coming on, and that's going to do it, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Anchor.fm. Oh, before I say thank you to everybody, let me just say one more thing. If all else fails, if all else fails and you are stumped on a certain matchup, just ask your mom. I'm not kidding. Just ask your mom. They will, if you have your mom, if I had my mom fill out this bracket, I guarantee you she will do better. Because what I've always learned in life is the less you know, the better. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't know. But no, but in all seriousness, yeah, just like ask, ask your mom because like they, for some reason, moms have powers to predict stuff in tournaments. It just, they win their office pools every year. I, it happens every single time. Every office you go to, there's at least one, one mom that wins. One mom. Every, Very every true. time. And it baffles me because, like, you just think, like, we put all this work in. We're doing all this data crunching. But then you see someone's mom. They wit, they come in. They fill out a bracket thinking, oh, this is so much fun. We're doing this as, an, as, as a group or something. And then they fill it out and they win all the, all the, the, the money in the pool. And you just think to myself, really? Anyway, thank you, everybody, for listening. I'll see you guys next time.